protect water quality in rivers and, um, and, and habitat of uh, both terrestrial and aquatic organisms. 
Uh, but I also wanted to, to mention a project that we're doing this year that I'm hoping that either you would like to participate in or would help promote. Um, we have a grant from the Lake Champlain Basin Program that allows us to convert lawn into, into wooded or you know, forested landscape. So not, we, have, we have free trees, we have the labor to plant them, it will be volunteer labor. And so if you have, or if you have a neighbor or a friend who has lawn that you would like to take out of, uh, out of grass and, and, and uh, convert to woody buffer, or not, sorry, not woody buffers, but to woody, um, uh, woody vegetation, which is better for habitat, uh, it helps absorb stormwater, so uh, it, it improves water quality and prevents flooding as well because uh, place, places where we have woody uh, vegetation, that vegetation is much better at not only storing carbon but also water. And so if we have a areas that are, you know, that, that are converted from lawn to woodies, then we get a better attenuation of uh, flood waters, better water quality, uh, better habitat. So um, we're really excited about this program, and I hope you would cons you'll consider talking to me about it. Right? You can write, I can get your name if you're interested. Uh, also, make sure you talk to your friends about it. We're wanting to, um, to get as many people involved as possible. Um, I don't know how long the trees are going to last and how, much, how, much we'll, you know, how many different properties we'll be able to do. Um, but so probably what we do is sort of develop a list of people who are interested and then make, you know, decide what, what our priorities are in terms of um, where those trees go. So I, I can't promise, oh, everybody gets free trees, but, um, but we, we have that program available and uh, something we're really excited about. How yep. many trees did you plant last year, Sean? Last year with the Friends of Winners, we planted 2,800 trees. Um, that's actually lower than our, it's lower than our actual average. We were kind of, we sort of feel like, I feel like I have to say that, you know, like 2,800. It's not, usually it's more like 4,000. This year we're planning, uh, the, the plan is to, to plant 3,800. Um, and we're hoping that that will, that will go up. So we'll get back to our 4,000 a year, um, so standard. But, um, and also, if you're at all interested in planting with us, um, we need volunteers all the time, um, especially in April and May. And so uh, if you're interested in planting trees, you can come put your name down, and I'll contact you about that. Also, if you're ever interested in, in sampling water, we do water quality sampling uh, all, year, all summer long. And so if you're interested in that, I can get your name for that, too. And I'd love to talk to anybody who's interested in what we do. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. I'm going to introduce Sarah Hoffmeyer and then can Libra talk. So Sarah. Yes, we're connected. Um, Sarah Hoffmeyer. Uh, what I love about the tree board is everybody has kind of a specialty that, that they bring to it. So Sean, rivers, river ecosystems, lens education, and it's so important to have that. My background is in landscape design. And um, through that lens, I feel like planting, you, you don't just want to go out and plant a tree anywhere. So planting it in the right space is really important. And everybody on the tree board, we kind of have our list that we go through. So calling dig safe before you plant a tree for underground utilities, other stuff that's underground. Um, and this all ties into the neighborhood tree planting. So we want to grow trees in neighborhoods and basically in the right of way is where we do our plantings. Um, and so the tree board will come out and we do dig safe for you. Uh, free labor and free tree, and you just have to water it. Um, we also send out email reminders for when to water. Um, it's a great program. We've already planted hundreds of trees in the last five years. If you think you have a spot that might be good for a tree, sign up with Ken. <laughs> he has the sign up list, um, and we'll come out and check it out for you. And we talk about you know, what's important to you? We don't want to plant a tree that in 20 years is going to shade out your vegetable garden. We really work with, how does this tree fit into your whole landscape? Um, but we need more trees on the streetscape in particular. There are a ton of benefits. Um, it's been shown that it reduces blood pressure when you're walking down the city street. It lowers traffic, lim um, the speed limits. People go slower when there's a big tree canopy. There are all these benefits for it, so we want Montpelier to have a lot of that. <laughs> If you want to know more, come talk to me. I'm going to be the tree board person now, not rather from the stand over here. Um, another thing that we're doing with the tree board is uh, trying to plant along streams in Montpelier. 
Um, and so, again, if you have even small little, you know, what people, sometimes people say, well, I've got just a ditch. I don't want to stream on my property. But uh, anything, if, you know, no matter what the size, um, we would like to plant along those two because uh, stream buffers, especially along the smaller streams, uh, the, more, the headwater streams, are really important in terms of water quality. So that's part of the Montpelier Tree Board um, mission for this year, too. Thank you. Ken, can you speak to being a volunteer? Sure. Um, I'm Ken Lewertow, and I've been a volunteer for, uh, I think Calvin Coolidge was president. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I came up to uh, Vermont like a lot of folks from the York City area, and I have to say I, I was concerned that Montpelier and the general area did not have what it should have in terms of tree cover, and it's been very exciting to see the work of and really making the city not only a tree city to be proud of, but the neighborhoods and area. So I just want people to know that not only do we need more trees, if I can quote you, Sarah, <laughs> um, we need more volunteers. Yeah. And uh, there are you know, all kinds of things you can do. Uh, obviously, you can close your eyes and think of a hot day in June right now and how pleasurable it will be be digging a hole for a tree, and that should make you want to sign up, and we really would like you to sign up before you leave. Uh, Lynn, I don't know if I got it right. Did you say if people don't sign up to be volunteers, they're not eligible for any of the incredible... <laughs> 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 to have you know all kinds of ideas there, there are things that you can add not only physical work uh, one of our board members or, or, or members of the tree committee came up with an idea of as people have children in, in town wouldn't it be great to offer them a tree to plant that would uh, you know in 10 15 25 30 years be magnificent but I also look around this room and I think we should expand it to include grandparents that have grandkids or something to make sure they're eligible because not everybody's going to go out after this meeting and uh, start new families and become eligible. <laughs> so whatever it takes, we want to do it and we want you to sign up. And I'll be around. I hope a few of you will uh, sign up. We can talk about how to get engaged over the year. Obviously, we'll be more work as the weather uh, hits spring. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. Can you tell us about Hi, everyone. Waste. Yeah, of course. So um, I'm an eco Maricoy serving at the Central Mont Solid Waste Management District. So our office is right in Montpelier, right in, on Berry Street. Dora, right. can you yell? <laughs> some, of, some of us can't hear. Okay. <laughs> um, so my name is Dora, and I'm serving at the Central yeah. Mont Solid Waste Management District. And uh, we are located right on Barry Street in Montpelier, and we serve 19 district um, towns in this district, and Montpelier is one of them. So our goal is to help you uh, learn how to compost and make sure that you're composting properly. And um, if you have any questions about that today, like feel free to come up to me. Um, and we also hold workshops and provide a lot of resources on our website and um, in other areas to help support people um, in their composting journey. So. Thank you, Dora. <laughs> Carrie. Hello. My name is Carrie Riker, and I work here at North Branch Nature Center with Emily. And Ken, Ben will be doing the uh, tree ID walk later. I'm here today to represent the ECO program, Educating Children Outdoors. We take 12 different schools outside as part of their regular school day, public schools as part of their school day, doing standards-based lessons. This is just a sample of some of our lessons that relate to that involve trees. Um, and I, we don't even have, we don't have a total of the number of teachers that we work with. I personally work with about um, 20 different teachers, 20 classrooms. So we should do a tally sometime to see how many we work with. But um, happy to host you all here. We also do summer camps and after school programs with children and then we have our newsletter is out in the hallway to show you all the other things we have going. So thank you for being here.
from Greenmouth Cemetery. It's the one that's located near the creamy stand on the sharp corner, um, down on Route 2. Uh, trees. When the cemetery began back in 1852, Calvin Keith, who, who requested money to buy land suitable for a cemetery, um, of course they bought a hillside, uh, wanted it planted thickly with trees. Because at that time, and we have some old pit photos, that whole hillside right up to Terra Street, it, it was all bare. It was from the sheep farm. So we're, 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 so there, a lot of trees have come and gone in Greenmount. We're starting to put them back in, in strategic places, per, you know, good species um, for, for whatever area that we have. Um, so what are we doing with the tree board? We make compost um, and we give them a little bit of compost every year for their street plantings. We are now have an area that we're doing green burials. We're calling them natural burials. There'll be no monuments, it'll just be flat markers. It'll be pollinators. Um, the first section will have an apple orchard within, the, with, within all the burials. Um, what I want you to, uh, I came here not to talk about cemetery lots, but just take a look at the cemetery and, and please use us as a classroom for trees. Um, our success story was 20, is about 28 years ago. We planted 10 black walnut trees down there. They're right along Route 2. This year we had more than, uh, nobody picked them all. Usually people take them and I don't get a chance to, to find them. But this year, we, you know, there was a, a great abundance of them. Um, and that was, you know, 26, 27 years ago when we spent $5 a tree. We were, um, I had one of my crotchety older cemetery commissioners had, write a letter, or had a forester write a letter saying they're not hardy. Um, but they are hardy. So we're, we're open to all kinds of ideas down there. And uh, just come and uh, let me know what you want. Thank you. Thank you. Before I move to this side of the room, I just want to not notify you all that uh, the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District has donated uh, a number of uh, tools that you can use for food scraps to soil. So we have a soil saver collecting uh, thing. These are for door prizes. And we have uh, two five gallon buckets and three containers that go on the countertop and a safe, healthy uh, cleaning kit made with uh, vinegar and, and uh, baking soda. So we want to thank the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District for their donations to the door prizes also. Greenmount Cemetery has donated a full yard of really rich compost that if your number gets drawn, you can pick that. And there are people here who have their eyes on that yard of compost. I already know that. We uh, have door prizes from the uh, uh, drawing board has given us some door prizes for children. We have uh, books that have come in that have been discounted to us from Bear Pond Books. Uh, Abby, what other door prizes do we have? Um, PJ Library. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. PJ Library, the beautiful story walk out there. Uh, Rabbi Toby Weissman with PJ Library set that up, and they brought some beautiful material here, and we have four or five books that are related to this special holiday of two spots in the selection for children. So thank you so much for that. Yeah. Um, and anything on the table, who have I, who have I left out? I know I left out some. All right. Uh, I want to come around real quickly. Can, can uh, John, can you tell us about your sure. display? Sure. John Akilosik, I'm with the tree board. Um, my display is all about the emerald ash borer, uh, which uh, is an invasive pest that kills ash trees. It arrived in this country back probably around 2002 spread to most of the states in the east, surrounded Vermont, uh, and finally invaded our state in 2018. If you folks are familiar with uh, the National Life Campus up on the hill, that's where we found the emerald ash borer in uh, several trees that have been cut down and chipped. Uh, so we're very concerned because it, it will kill all the ash trees if, if it's left unchecked. And um, what we've done is basically 
decided to try to slow the spread because you really can't stop it. There's nothing to do in terms of stopping this bug. Um, it will kill all your ashes unless you treat them um, with uh, uh, amamectin, benzoate, which is a, uh, a pesticide that's injected into the tree and, and can kill the bug when it comes to eat on the leaves. Um, we are concerned, again, about the spread, so we're doing a monitoring program every year to see where it's spread from the national life or where it shows up. For that, we need volunteers to help do surveys of the street trees. We have 400 plus street trees, ash trees, in, in the city. We have about 170 ash trees along trails in Hubbard Park. If you're familiar with Hubbard Park, there are a bunch of ash trees along trails there. So um, those trees are at risk. And then we did a, uh, a statistical study to figure out how many trees were on private property. And in Montpelier alone, there's probably 2,700 ash trees on private property. So it's very important for us to try to slow the spread. And the way we can do that is to identify where the bug has gotten to and remove those trees and the, uh, the offspring that are in the trees, the larvae that are in the trees. So I do um, welcome you to come and look at our display, become familiar with the emerald ash borer and ash trees, and ask any questions you have about uh, what's going on with ash trees in, in Montpelier. Thank you, John. Thank you. Yep. Jack, what you got? My name is Jack. I am serving in Eco AmeriCorps with Montpelier's Parks and Trees Department. And I have a fun tree identification activity over here. Um, leaf ID. And then we also have these really beautiful photos that John Snell took, um, which are really fun to test your knowledge. It says what kind of tree it is on the back. And then we also have this giant tree cookie from a tree um, taken down from Bailey Street. So come over and try and see if you can count the rings and see how old it is. We're really lucky today to have our mayor here to give us a welcome. So I would like to introduce Ann Watson to just say a few words. Watson and Mayor Montpelier, and I am so excited uh, for this event uh, and to hear Cat Buxton speak. Um, I actually got a chance to hear uh, Cat Buxton actually at uh, the VCAN conference back in December, and I found it, I didn't tell you this, but I, I found it deeply inspiring. Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about soils in Montpelier and uh, what we can be doing as a community. Um, having healthy soils is everyone's business. Uh, that's something that we all need to be um, thinking about. And uh, so I've been thinking about having a, a neighborly competition, if you will, uh, as to how we can potentially be converting our yards, like our front yards or our side yards, to uh, away from grass uh, and towards uh, various things like, um, uh, like uh, pollinator yards or food producing yards, fruit and nut trees, uh, vegetable growing, tree, uh, yards, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and so I, I'm anticipating um, that perhaps not for this summer, uh, but perhaps for the next summer, um, we can be uh, exploring the possibility of having a, a, a good neighborhood uh, Montpelier-based competition. Who can have the, uh, the best uh, pollinator yards or the best uh, fruit growing or, or vegetable growing yards, that sort of thing. This year we might spend some time doing some education uh, about how uh, we can best be uh, changing the soil in our yards to um, to be healthy and what makes sense for our for the places where we live. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and thanks for um, giving me an opportunity to, to uh, talk about that briefly. Um, there's going to be more information coming out about that soon. Uh, but uh, I, I that's all I have to say for now. And I'm so excited to to uh, hear about uh, what Kat has to say. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. We are now at the moment where Kat Buxton can begin saying what she has to say. And I met, I met Kat in uh, February or March at a, a soil series, and I cannot believe that I was hearing someone talk about things that I noticed happening in my own yard. And so, Kat, 
is going to show you what it is that I learned in my own yard. All right, so um, hi everybody, I'm Kat Buxton. I live in Thetford currently, from the Upper Valley. Um, oh, thanks, do you want me to clip that or? Okay. You might be wondering what I'm doing with bread. We're gonna make some sandwiches. <laughs> Not for. Um, this bread is a stand-in for a landscape. And in this container, I have flour, which is a stand-in for another landscape. I, I love some volunteers. <laughs> Can we get one more volunteer? No. Yeah. Okay. So this is a rain cloud. There are little holes poked in the bottom. This is a stand-in for a degraded landscape, otherwise known as dirt, which is for the purposes of this analogy, this is sand, silt, and clay. This is a stand-in for a healthy landscape. <coughs> Can anyone tell me what makes bread bread? Like, how does it get fluff in it? Yeast. Louder? Yeast. yeast. Yes. Yeast. Is yeast alive or dead? Alive. alive. Does flour have yeast in it? No. no. Okay. So. Degraded landscape, sand, silt, and clay. Healthy landscape, sand, silt, and clay, and biology, living organisms. Could you be the rain cloud? And could you be the creator who makes the rain? <laughs> and so you wanna just maybe hold your rain cloud up a little bit higher. There you go, right over the top, and, and fill that cup to the top. Okay, that's probably good. Now, what is happening in this degraded landscape? Shout it out. Getting, Getting wet. Getting wet. There's flooding. Erosion. 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 Yep. What else? Flooding. Erosion. What color is that water? Murky. Murky. How come? Mixed with <laughs> degraded <laughs> landscape. Yes, sand, silt, and clay. Yeah, it's not flour anymore. <laughs> okay, if I was a plant living in this landscape or a tree, would I have just gotten a drink? If we were to take this paddle and poke a hole in the middle of this pile of flour, would it be wet or dry at the bottom? Do you want to try that? And, and go ahead and find the plate. And then you'll have to look with your eyes to see, is it wet or dry? dry? It is dry. So this is flooding and drought in the same place at the same time. <coughs> Let's rain on the healthy landscape and see if you guys know what to do now. Maybe this do you want to turn? Sure. OK. Can she be the creator? This is a rain cloud. So he's going to hold that. that this is a healthy landscape. It's bread. <laughs> but it's a healthy landscape. You can fill that cup right to the top. OK, hold your cloud up a little bit so everyone can see what is happening to this landscape. Our rain cloud slowed down a little bit with the second pour. I have a spare. Okay, go ahead and just pour that whole cup right on that bread. Uh, la healthy landscape. Okay. Oh, because it's dry right there? Here, let's um, rain. Yeah. A little more water. It's raining. 
<laughs> it's raining and interesting. Okay, so what's happening to this landscape? So uh, go ahead and pour the rest of that. Okay, this landscape. We just poured more water, by the way, about half as much again. And um, what's happening here? It absorbed, the it absorbed the water. If we were to pour another cup of water on this landscape, what would happen? It would soak it up. It would soak it up, and at some point it would get saturated. And then we might get some water around this landscape. And what color would that water be? Clear. Why? Why is this one cloudy and this one clear? Because it filters it. It filters it. Soil is a filter. Healthy soil is a filter. And so the big difference between degraded soil and healthy soil is? Biology. Biology. Yes. In a plant. In, for the sake of this and that, this is a wonderful teaching tool for people of all, thank you so much, for people of all ages. Um, thank you, Jesus. Um, so, if I were a plant in this landscape, would I have just gotten a drink? Yeah. If I were to poke my finger all the way through these four slices of bread, AKA healthy landscape, would it be wet or dry at the bottom? Wet. wet. Moist. Do you want to try? Can I try too? Yeah, two fingers, each of you, yep, yeah, right, right to the bottom. You're gonna have to push your hand in a little. Is it wet or dry down there? Wet. It's wet. <laughs> yeah. So if you lived in a place where you got only two inches of rain a year, which landscape would you rather be in? Hmm? The healthy. The healthy, the bread. I usually have two different color plates, but I didn't I forgot my blue plate today, sorry. So if you lived in a place that was really, really windy, which would you rather be in? Red. What would happen if I was a windstorm right now? Oh. Hold your breath. So it just rained really, really hard. Flooding, drought in the same place, can dust I, bowl. Can I do it? Um, <laughs> you can. Blow that way. Yeah. See that? What about this one? Can you blow on this one? What's going to happen? Blow really, really hard. Harder. Okay. okay. That was a good blow. Nothing happened. If you lived in a place where you got 16 inches of rain a year, which place would you rather be in? Healthy. You get it. So you get it? Yeah. Great exercise. So this was designed by a woman named Dee Dee Pursehouse who lives in Thetford with a high school biology teacher as they were teaching students about soil health. And this activity has now been done all over the world. Um, it doesn't matter what language you use, the activity works. And one tip I can give you, gas station bread <laughs> is the key. Um, and then I don't feel so bad about wasting food because I don't like to waste food. We live in times where a lot of people don't have access to food. Um, it is compostable. Um, it doesn't generally mold on its own, which is kind of weird. Um, but with the help of other microbes, it will. Thank you so much. All right, we'll leave that out for, for y'all to look at. Uh, another extension of this um, activity is using Monopoly houses um, and pieces of plants. And after about an hour or so, the piece of plant here is just completely wilted because, of course, it never got a drink. Um, but this one, sometimes you can take and stick in a glass of water and actually root at the end of the day. So um, it works in the Monopoly houses, also help, especially when I'm doing this work out in California. Uh, we can talk about mudslides, which is what people there, kids out there say mudslides, not erosion. <laughs> Interesting, right? Um, okay, so I have some slides I'd like to take you through. Um, Kat Buxton is my name. Grow More, Waste Less is my business. 
soil health principles, which I've got here for your continued reference. Um, if, if you leave here with one thing today, I hope it's that you understand there are principles of soil health. They were designed by, well, people have known this for as long as people have been on the planet. I think it's really worth saying that these are principles, not practices. Um, but the NRCS, which is the Natural Resources Conservation Service, recently, within the last few years, coined the top four as being the soil health principles that we all need to embrace. Number five was coined by a guy named Gabe Brown. Anybody here ever heard of Gabe Brown? Amazing rancher from North Dakota. His book is one of the prizes over on the table. <coughs> from Dirt to Soil um, and one of my mentors. And number six, slow and sink the water. It just makes sense. And if these are all in place, this happens. Um, but I like to include that as a, as a principle as well. Um, a lot of words on that slide. I'm not probably going to stick around long enough on it for you to read them all so read fast. <laughs> um, but healthy soil really is the thing that holds our communities in place. Um, have you all heard about the trees talk? Mm -hmm. Right? So that happens underground. Um, and it happens through microbial activity. Um, there are billions and billions and billions of microbes in the ground. Uh, in fact, on us, in us, all over, every single living thing. And they're part of who makes rain happen in our atmosphere. So microbes are everywhere, and we're just starting to learn about microbes. And in terms of soil microbes, um, we know anywhere from 5 <coughs> to 20% of what we think there might be to know about soil microbiology. And what we're learning is flipping everything else we know upside down, which is so exciting. In a single teaspoon of healthy soil, you might find 75,000 species of bacteria, 10 to 20,000 species of nematodes, a few hundred nem um, protozoa, <coughs> microarthropods, earthworms, and some of the bigger guys that we could see with our naked eye one teaspoon. In that same teaspoon, there could be a mile of stretched out fungal hyphal <coughs> strands. One teaspoon. And those fungal hyphal strands, or those are just little filaments of fungus, some of which are that mycorrhizal fungus that we're starting to learn so much about and is really exciting. What can we learn from that? So one of the things I like to do in the world is talk about um, how can we build the social mycelium to hold our communities together mimicking the mycelium underground, literally holding our landscapes together. So biomimicry, what can we learn? Um, I'm going to take you through a little short thing I like to call sunshine to aggregate. And this is how it all works. These are the drivers of everything that we know. Um, and it all comes back to the sun. Thank goodness we have the sun. And today, it's a great day for sun. So making the connection to the circle of life of through sunlight, carbon, and water. We've been hearing a lot about carbon. And I think it's cool that people want to learn about carbon. But we have to remember that carbon is constantly cycling. We don't just take it out of one place and put it in another. That's not really how it works. It's a cycle. Um, so when we compost, for instance, we're taking carbon and we're making compost. And it's respirating carbon. It's so respirating CO2 and nitrogen and possibly even methane, depending on how you're doing it. So it's a cycle. We need to engage in that as a cycle and not a compartmentalized, put it here or put it, put it there. So photosynthesis, water, light, and chemical energy. The sun has an energy budget for Earth. And I like to focus on this 50% of the sunlight that shines down. 50% is absorbed by the planet. 40 to 60% is actually invested by plants into their root systems to feed billions and billions and billions of organisms under the ground. And that is the soil food web, which was really just coined as a phrase in the 1990s. So it's a very, very new part of science. So we're going to focus down there, which also, by the way, helps to drive the water cycle. This area, highlighted in blue, is uh, what we call the rhizosphere, which is so rise is root. So it's the area around root systems. We're beginning to learn that this tree root system is actually much larger 
than this picture shows us, of course, depending on the kind of tree and the kind of conditions it's growing in. This is a close-up of a single root hair. And that blue area is describing the rhizosphere. The little red dots in there are a stand-in for um, bacteria uh, and other organisms. The white lines coming in and out, that's mycorrhizal fungus. So those are the fungal hyphal hairs that actually connect to even the finest root hairs and offer that kind of really dynamic intelligence and communication that we don't really embody so well as a species. In that rhizosphere and all around that in the soil, we have the soil food web. And it's not about one species. You know, you could have lots of bacteria in your soil, but if you don't have nematodes and protozoa coming in there and eating and pooping, there's no nutrient cycling. So these organisms, all of them, produce organic acids that can actually dissolve sand, silt, and clay, taking all of the nutrients and making them available to plants and then all of the other creatures that eat those plants and bugs, etc. So this is how our biome is built, our gut biome. Having the, all the different spheres of organisms is incredibly important. And this is what is new about the soil food web that we didn't know before. Just bacteria is not enough. And when we think about the kinds of bacteria, I see a lot of really worrisome products on the market. Like, we're, you got these 12 bacteria. I'm like, great, 12 out of 75,000 potential species? How'd you pick those? <laughs> <laughs> and are they from my region? Can they even survive here? Did they make it through the mail? <laughs> we just don't really know a lot about these organisms. Um, but we know that they are the drivers of nutrient systems. So back to pedogenesis, the first lichen attached itself to rock. That was the system I just described. It's photosynthesis with the exudates, those carbons, the CO2 out of the air being turned into sugars, Think of them as like the cakes and cookies. One of my teachers, Elaine Income, likes to talk about that. The cakes and cookies that feed the microbes under the ground. And not all microbes like the same flavor cupcake. They like all different kinds of flavors that come in from all different kinds of trees and all different kinds of plants. So diversity begets diversity begets diversity. These root systems, this is a slide from um, the southwestern prairie plants. So a lot of these plants are not ours, but you probably, the gardeners in there probably recognize a few, like lupin and echinacea. Um, there are some mustards in here. Um, but the point is more that if the soil, if the geological conditions can support it, we can have root systems that go this deep. So if we don't have like big rocks in our soil and ledge, we can have root systems that go this deep. And I just like to point out that this is 15 feet. Did you have any idea that plants could go that deep? These are perennial plants. And when we think back to this and that, I get really excited about the potential of numbers and diversity of those organisms that are cycling nutrients for us. There was no one walking through the forest with a bag of fertilizer, right? We don't need bags of amendments to make plants get nutrients that they need. All we need is the biology that can turn sand, silt, and clay into every single element and nutrient that we need. That's how nature's been doing this long before chemical companies. This is your standard lawn. <laughs> Um, so when we think about lawns, this is a slide that's actually from, uh, it's, it's in the context of grazing. So this is getting into what happens under the ground when you chop above the ground. This is how we recommend grazing. This is often how it happens. This is never how we mow our lawns, right? Can we change how often we mow? Can we change the amount of space that is even mowable, which I love this contest you're, you're putting forward. I think that's really great. But I like lawns too, you know. It's just nothing like laying on the warm grass, uh, dry, warm grass in the middle of summer. 
or using it for badminton or you know any number of things like lawns can be great so how do we shrink those how do we manage those in a way that supports the life underground how can we do that um, and I could give you lots of ways we could but I bet you can come up with your own as well so can we build soil faster than the lost rate um, this picture down here is pretty famous at this point. Um, that is Long Island sign, Sound after Tropical Storm Irene. That's Vermont's topsoil and dirt roads. I personally know farmers that lost the entire farm, literally all of their topsoil went down the river. Um, and these are you know, organic farmers, well-meaning, wonderful folks that till a lot. They make flour. They specialize in making flour out of landscapes. That's what tilling machines do. Um, this is Iowa corn in 2018, and you can almost see the soil leaving and going down that river, even in that still shot. So it's as if the dust bowl didn't happen, we are now planting directly up to the river banks again. What did you just say tillers do? Tillers, mm -hmm. if, if I were to take a tiller on this spread, I would get this flower. So um, tilling, disturbance of any kind, I mean, just think about it. You're a little microbe in the ground and this big machine comes at you, right? Ah! Yeah, it happens um, and we kill microbes. That's how we've created more desertified landscapes across the globe than any other species. <laughs> Go humans. Um, and tillage is a big part, not the only part, but a big part of it. Um, so how do we avoid compaction and improve water infiltration? When we're thinking about planting trees in urban areas, compaction is definitely something to consider with all of our houses and our walking and our you know, cars and tractors and all of this pavement. Um, we are compacting, so we're not allowing a place for water to infiltrate like the bread, right? So how do we get the biology back into our landscapes to build the sponge? This is a soil carbon sponge. Soil carbon sponge. Carbon and water fill soil with life and sustain life when we create the conditions to invite carbon and water back into our landscapes. On the top is a NRCS rainfall simulator. Anybody ever seen one of those in action? It's a really cool um, exercise. Uh, the five blocks of soil all have a bit of a screen on the bottom so that they won't fall through, but it's basically like a cookie cutter. And each of those blocks of soil is representing a different kind of management on top of the ground. So we have everything from this one, which it, I can see some of the soil health principles in place, like living roots in the ground, yep. Uh, maximize diversity, I see at least two different kinds of leaves. Uh, minimize disturbance. I, I don't see any tillage, don't know if there were chemicals. Uh, minimize bare soil, there's really none. Animals in contact with the soil, maybe that's from a grazing pasture. So that's got our five soil health principles. This one has none, zero soil health principles. Um, is that clear? What? Whoops, 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 there we go. <laughs> When we pour water on this landscape, much like the flour and bread exercise, the back line of jars is collecting how much water infiltrated into the ground. The front line of jars is how much water ran off. So notice that the bare soil has no infiltration. It's just like the flour. The bottom of the plate was dry. And this is also just like the flour. All of the water that ran off is the same color of the substance it ran off from. On this side, with living roots in the ground, we had 100% infiltration. And the color of the water is pretty good. And we had no runoff. It's a really fun activity. And I, I, there's lots of ways you can try it at home without big fancy equipment. Um, and then this bottom picture is just basically the same thing, but just talking about runoff. <clears throat> when we have good ground cover, we get almost no, this is just runoff, it's a little confusing, it's not infiltration down here. Cities, of course, if we have 100% pavement, we're going to get 100% runoff. So let's talk about that water. That water is a gift from the skies, that is rainwater, that is water is life. And we 
create systems where we take that rainwater and throw it away like a waste product. We say get out of here as soon as possible, get down to the sound, bring all our toxins with it, just get out, you're a problem. <coughs> And now we're thinking about, let's, let's manage this better. We have these green stormwater infrastructure programs, really well-intentioned, but it's more concrete and metal. How about the soil carbon sponge as a way of managing green stormwater? Like, this is green stormwater infrastructure right here. And the laborers are the billions and billions and billions of biological organisms that live under the soil and are supported by the plants feeding them through photosynthesis. We can manage water better by allowing it to infiltrate and soak in and retain in place. Where it fell, it's retained. That's the way nature does it. Rain gardens, we can get really creative with this. And I know Montpelier has some pretty great rain gardens. I think the ESU has one. BSECU. Um, -E yeah, great hospitals. This is some inspiring stuff that I've been seeing more and more of. Rooftop gardens, vertical gardens. Um, this one is uh, in Burlington. Um, they have a rooftop garden and they let their patients like walk up in the gardens and the food goes into the hospital. And the last time I checked in with that hospital, which is a number of years ago, they had a policy that 50% of the food served in their hospital would come from within 100 miles of the hospital and they actually send their administrative staff in the food service out to farms to meet growers. And those relationships, that social mycelium is really where all of that change starts. Um, one of the many hats I wear is I run an edible schoolyard at Thetford Elementary School in Thetford. I've uh, been there for about 10 years. It's a K through six. We have 13 raised beds, raspberries, Blueberries, cranberries, peach trees, pear trees, apple trees, and an on-site composting system. And uh, the kids plant all the seeds. They grow the gardens. We have summer school in the summertime. Um, they do a harvest meal every year and lots of other curriculum-based projects. Um, this is some of the food that goes into their cafeteria. And uh, we also have a five-bin on-site hop composting system where the fifth and sixth graders manage all of the food waste produced at the school, including meat and bones. 200 pounds of food scraps a week are managed by the students there. Um, Upper Valley Apple Corps is another hat I wear. Uh, much like the tree board and a lot of what I see a lot of the people in this room doing, going out and planting fruit and nut trees, we like to do it in public places and make sure that everyone knows that the fruits are free for the picking. Uh, and we do a lot of education to support the care of the trees, um, helping us build skills about how to live with trees and be stewards, uh, and also how to, how to use the fruit coming off of the trees, um, especially for our lowest income population, many of which don't even have access to a toaster oven. Um, this is a food forest that we're putting together in White River Junction. Um, as a part of the Riverwalk Trail. Um, it's a really exciting place at the Center for Transformational Practice. And what we've done here is we've put in a lot of uh, many different species, really trying to maximize diversity. It's a training ground, so we're also trying things like pool culture and composting of various styles. Um, and we have uncovered many of the native species um, that, well, whether they were native to the area for a long time or whether they were just remnants of the Abenaki who are still here, um, we found apple groves, berry patches, um, and some nut groves that were natural. Uh, in a uh, park in Stratford, the Edible Pocket Park, another just really cool idea. It's a tiny little peninsula, and they planted amazing um, guilds. Each one of these is considered like a guild with lots of plants to support the, the main trees, like this is the Plum Guild. <coughs> I highly recommend checking that place out. Um, a guild, anyone, raise your hand if you've never heard that term in, in used for trees. Okay, um, so a guild, as we know it from a human standpoint, a guild is a, a group of people that supports one another. Uh, artist guild, builders guild, etc. cetera. Um, tree guilds, in terms of plants are a grouping of plants that support the tree. Um, and this is a permaculture concept. 
and I don't want to get too into great detail, but um, some of the things that you'd be looking for are um, plants with very deep tap roots, like comfrey or dandelion, or many of our locust types uh, or lupins. Those have, they're a dynamic accumulator. So when we go back to thinking about the rhizosphere and that area that's full of biological organisms and dealing with compaction, those are plants that are really good at penetrating soil, bringing lots of fine root hairs with them that are coated in biological organisms that then help to bring up the nutrients from the subsoil to the plants available. Another functional um, part might be a mulching plant. So uh, comfrey is another one, or any, any of the plants that grow lots of leaves on top, and especially if they die back and then grow a second round in our summers here, those are mulchers, so they're natural suppressants. Things don't like to grow up through that big pile of leaves, and then those leaves become soil. Another one is a pollinator attractor, or attractor of any kind, not just pollinators. There are lots of beneficial insect functions, and pollination is really important, but it's not the only one. So those are some of the examples of the roles that different plants in a guild might play. And certain plants can have multiple roles that they can play. Um, so rethinking lawns, it sounds like there's a movement to do that in Montpelier, and that is really cool. Again, lawns can be great. I think it's important to think about how is this space used. If people like to play in this lawn, and we know it's this area, let's leave that lawn and let's build up everything else with shrubs and trees and perennial plants. How can we deepen those root systems? How, we, how can we increase biodiversity? I was just thinking when you were talking about the, the selection for like what you might win, um, what about who's got the most number of species? You know, who can have the most diversity in their lawn? <laughs> that could be a really cool thing. There are so many, the, the number of lawns is anywhere from 30 to 50 million, depending on what you look at. Some uh, include state grounds, and some include golf courses, and some are only <laughs> residential, and I think it's a really hard thing to track generally. But it's a huge amount of acreage that we cover in lawns that have no support system for everybody else underground. So how can we change that? How can we do it at school? How can we do it in towns, on state land, in our home lawns? Um, and, and what do we do it with? Can we just willy-nilly plant anything? Um, I, I would suggest trying to pay attention to what is growing around our region and what other creatures need in our region. So uh, an oak tree can support something like 300 different insects? 456. 456 species, right? Not even of butterflies. Of butterflies. So microbes, macros, above the ground insects, birds, larvae, humans, mammals, like who else is using that tree? And if you're bringing in an ornamental that you really love the smell of that flower, but no one else can use it, well, maybe you just have one of those. You know, I'm not saying don't delight yourself with wonderful smells. Um, but let's, let's think about who else lives here um, and how we need to support each other because it's not just us supporting them. Without them, we are done, right? Um, so diversity and species, think about structurally. This is one reason why the edges are so exciting, like the edge of field, the edge of atmosphere, the edge of places is where the highest amount of diversity and function is. If you think about the edge of a field, you've got all these different species that are layering up into a tree line. And that's where you're going to find the largest amount of diversity. Hardiness and tolerance to our region, I mean, we got to do this <laughs> or, or you're just wasting your money. Um, Nate, where is it from? Uh, how will it perform here in our region? Um, you know, we like forsythia up here. I think forsythia is a wonderful bush. But where I'm originally from in Connecticut, they hate it because it grows everywhere. It takes over entire banks. Here it's like a nice, neat little bush. So how is the plant going to react in our environment? Um, attracting insects of all kinds of pollinators are great, but there are lots more to consider. 
of the 900,000 insects that we know about, and we argue about whether or not there are you know, twice as many as that, only 1% are known to be harmful to humans, and only a fraction of those are agricultural pests. And yet we've managed an insect apocalypse trying to eradicate a fraction of 1%. And we didn't do it. We didn't eradicate them. Um, edible landscapes. Wild plants are amazing, right? And more nutritious than most of the things we buy in the grocery store. Um, so know your wild plants. Be thinking of those for your lawn. Uh, one of my favorite times to not my, mow my lawn is in early spring, when it, everything first starts coming up and all the grasses are the most nutritious because they've just stored their energy all winter long and you can eat violet leaves and you can, I mean, and violet flowers and it's just, it's like a, a, a green shop in the lawn. Um, that's an exciting time to learn about wild edibles. It's also when you can find wild leeks and fiddleheads in our region. Invasive plants, I just wanna, I put this slide in here because I just like to encourage people to think differently about these plants. Um, the word invasive I find very troublesome. Um, and if we wanna really think about invasive species, we need to look no further than the mirror. Um, and I like to think of these plants like, are we, do we know everything we need to know before we judge this path of eradication, which we've never been good at, zero success stories. Um, so we might want to just think about that. Are these plants the first responders? Are they the first ones to cover bare ground? Are they the first ones to conduct photosynthesis and encourage bio biological systems underground? I don't know that they always are, but I just think these are important questions to ask before we deem anything as invasive or does not belong. Um, and I always like to end with actions. There are so many things we can do. And I think the most important of all of them is do. Actually do it. Get out and volunteer with the tree board. Dig some holes. Bring water to those trees for the first three years. Um, harvest the fruit. Teach your neighbors. Teach your friends. Eat the fruit. <laughs> Um, do. We are, you know, I just, I heard um, a quote from a woman who is uh, in Australia where I'm sure everybody knows at this point that there were massive, like we've never seen before on earth, fires in Australia. And she, her quote was, the time for reskilling is over. We're in survival mode. So that really sat with me. And I, you know, we like to talk about getting together and talk about how we're gonna do this and how we wanna do this and let's you know, talk about carbon sequestration. Let's talk about all this stuff. How about we do it? Let's go to our school and start a compost system. Let's start a garden in our schools. Let's plant trees in our towns. Let's work together and support each other as we do this. And that's it. Thank you. Opportunity to ask Kat some questions. So for five minutes, let's let's give Kat a chance to answer your personal questions. Any questions? Mm. Yeah. Japanese knotweed showed up on your edibles slide. How do you like to prepare your when, and when it first comes up in the spring, when the shoots are about this tall, uh, I cook it like asparagus. Um, I don't, you know, I couldn't possibly eat enough <laughs> of it. So don't ask me to come cut yours down. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, what a prolific plant, right? I mean, amazing. I, and um, it also contains medicine. Um, uh, some of the most promising medicine to treat Lyme disease is yeah. actually found as a compound in that plant. Isn't oh. that interesting? What does it taste like? Um, it tastes kind of like a sour asparagus. Um, it's somewhere between rhubarb and asparagus ish. <laughs> it tastes like knotweed. <laughs> but yeah, something like that. Um, I, I have some farmer friends that um, harvest it and take it down to New York City and sell it as red asparagus for $10 a pound. <laughs> Yeah. Um, 
I think it's great to go out and eat, a, eat not weed, but I really caution people about don't plant it. Oh, don't, no. don't, yeah. don't be, we've got enough of it everywhere. Oh, and, no. and it is, and it does not really support a very much diversity in terms of wildlife or, um, or soil organisms. And so I just, you know, eat it where you find it, but don't. We don't know it. how many soil organisms it supports. Well, the studies that have been done at least so far. I'll just say that. So it's not, we've got plenty of it. We don't need any more of it. And it, it's, um, uh, you know, it, it does, I mean, I think it depends on what you look at. If you look at, you know, it's, it's pretty good in terms of nature source for, for pollinators, but it also pretty much will, will eliminate any native species that's in the area. So, yeah, um, I think it's, you just be careful with it. Yeah, no, I totally hear that. Yeah. Caution is important. One of the things I wonder about that plant, is it going to be the plant that holds our rivers in place? It does not, it absolutely does not do that. It, it, it destroys no, this, this, we, we, well, it destroys it, the ecosystem. It destroys the stream bank um, because it does not have those fine root structures that you're talking about that are so important. Yeah. It only has rhizomes. It doesn't have root hairs. It doesn't. So it it, it actually destabilizes the banks, and that's how it it, it moves. So, I know after uh, so Irene, we have it. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it, after Irene, it, it just it all of a sudden we have it everywhere because um, <laughs> it doesn't have those root hairs to hold the stream banks together. Just when the, when when high water comes. It, it actually will break pit the knot we often carry it down. So that's that's the way that it's designed to work. I mean, that's, that's how it's evolved. So, so the good news is, is, if you're out there and you see all this knot and you don't plant it, just harvest yeah, it right, and yeah, take it over yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and the bamboo left afterwards can be used for all sorts of crafts and things as well. Um, I also often get asked, can I use that in my compost? My answer is don't. Don't put it in. Um, because I've seen it re-sprout from an apparently dead. But if you do, Take good notes and tell me how it works. Other questions? I was wondering a little bit about the process of uh, starting your food forest, your uh, food forest model down, I guess, in Brattleboro? Uh, no, so that's in White River Town. Excuse me. Yeah? yeah? Could you just explain a little bit about how, that process and how that started? Um, so it started because uh, we had an abandoned woodlot, abandoned by people, and, and lots of trash was put in there and we're trying to clean this up. And um, so we, this is in a neighborhood where there were lots of children and a, a windy road that was super dangerous. So we were trying to build um, paths, footpaths, that connected a park into this nice wood zone where we all find treasures in there, um, and created these paths. And then it became a place we began celebrating. And this particular place has every kind of invasive plant you could think of in our region. There are no less than nine really aggressive species, buckthorn, bayberry, um, knotweed, um, garlic mustard, on, you know, euonymus, they're all there. Um, the the multiflora rose that can grow 50 up, foot up in a tree and strangle it, it's there too. And we thought, you know what, we could, um, you know, what would humans do and what have they tried to do in the past year? They've tried to come in and clean out all the bad stuff. Didn't work. They created conditions where all of those plants thrive <laughs> instead. So we began celebrating those plants and eating the rose hips off of those really tall trees and eating the grapes that grew there um, and using some of those materials to make things and then planting in any places where we did try to remove species, we would plant in with native species, cover that ground right away. And then over time it evolved into, we started planting nut trees and fruit trees and um, all kinds of shrubs. Um, and so it just evolved into a food forest. So it started out as a neighborhood project um, for safety and water at a waterfront access, and then it evolved. Uh, from there, and it's still evolving, and anyone can come visit. Cat, if I could add to what you're saying, uh, if you walk what we used to call the bike path, and you go down between, say, the high school all the way to where you're heading to the train tracks, so the Sebo Weenabee path has blueberries and, and pear trees and plum trees, and what else? Mm. Jack, what else have you guys planted out there? Elderberry? Elderberry? So those things are actually fruiting now. And what, what we really need as a tree board is a group of people who would like to join us and sign up on Ken's list 
to help us manage that this summer. There's some pruning that's needed. There's harvesting needed. We need to put uh, maybe some fallen leaves in distinguished spaces out there. But, but we need to keep taking care of those trees that we've already planted. And then our uh, terminator here, Steve Bailey, who is a, uh, uh, an amazing force of, of interest with uh, knotweed, will be out there this summer leaving spaces where we can plant. So he will be removing the knotweed, and we can go in and plant more. Get right in there. Yeah, food stuffs. So I'm sorry, we don't want to call the terminator. <laughs> but uh, you know, we're working towards that food forest idea. So I just wanted to bring that into the picture. That's great. Yeah. I just I love the concept of food forest, and the the pocket park that I mentioned is you could call that a food forest, except it's really pretty small. So we call it a pocket park. It sounds cuter. Um, any other? One more question? Yeah. I just um, wanted to ask if it might be prudent of anybody who's interested in wild harvesting, even if it's from your lawn, just please be aware of a lot of these species, including knotweed, they draw toxins. They're a bioremediator. Um, so if you're within a certain foot of a road, or anywhere where a car has been parked for a long time, just please use wisdom because mm -hmm. plants inherently will draw up <coughs> a lot of things and then you're eating it. So yeah, thanks for saying that. Yeah, um, I guess that you didn't mention that. Yeah. So I guess I want, I, and that's the <laughs> other side of earlier I talked about dynamic accumulator as being a, a functional guild plant. Same concept. Those oftentimes those same plants they accumulate nutrients, but they also accumulate toxins, um, which in some scenarios means that those toxins are being held um, and out of being taken out of soil. Hence the remediation piece. This is one way to try and remove toxins from soils to use certain plants and then compost those plants, hoping or sometimes knowing that the soil biology is going to further remediate those toxins in a compost pile. Really interesting stuff. Um, so I do have a table out here with lots of activities that I welcome you to touch all of them. I have seeds and soil samples and um, all sorts of really cool things, plastic bugs and magnifying glasses. Um, and I'm happy to answer your questions out there as well if you don't want to ask them in the crowd format. Big hand for the